Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. We're live from the Geelong Performing Arts Centre, GPAC, answering your questions tonight. The Chief Executive of the Geelong Regional Alliance, Elaine Carbines. Green Senator Richard Di Natale. Local Liberal MP Sarah Henderson. Local Labor member Richard Miles and the flamboyant Mayor of Geelong, Richard... <laughs> I beg your pardon, Darren <laughs> Lyons. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> Well, Q&A is simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. You can join the Twitter conversation using the Quanda hashtag on your screen. And remember, if you have a live question, add at Quanda to help us find it. Well, Geelong has been one of the region's hardest hit by Australia's declining manufacturing industry. Tonight, we're focusing on the implications for all Australians. Our first question comes from Henry Fuller. Um, I've been an auto worker in, here in Geelong for 27 years. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about retraining. Um, but retraining to what? Where are the jobs going to come from? And um, as a mature worker, I'm going to have to compete with 20-year-olds in the job market for the first time in 30 years. Um, what specific training is available to me? And um, what are the jobs going to be in, in one or two years' time when I finally get made redundant at Fords? Let's start with the Mayor of the Town, Darren. Well, look, uh, oh, it's a very difficult situation that this town has seen itself in. But it's not uh, that this town hasn't been in this before. <coughs> Reskilling the bay is extremely important. Um, the jobs that are available today, I mean, I think as a council and as a mayor and uh, as a city, uh, jobs are being produced. In fact, there are going to be 4,300 jobs being produced over the next 12 months in this, in this area. We are very, very confident about reskilling people. I think it's all about re-education and certainly I'm sure Richard will have uh, things to say on this about reskilling and also Sarah Henderson, but the government really needs to focus on not only Alcoa and Ford workers. I've certainly been in private meetings with both Alcoa and Ford. I feel really confident that they really have Geelong people and the Geelong workers that have given them so much power and passion over the years that they are putting the workers first. Uh, the fact of the matter is we are changing, the economy is changing, we've gone through a global economic crisis. Australia and Geelong, really, we've do dodged a nuclear bomb, not just dodged a bullet, but there's certainly going to be changes in all our lives for the future. Elaine. It's really important to know that you won't be on your own. There are um, a number of government departments already working with retrenched workers from Alcoa and Ford uh, through the, the Business Transitions Program. And the state government's setting up a workforce development centre that's going to operate out of the Gordon. That's a one-stop shop for retrenched workers to go in and meet everybody that is associated with uh, Centrelink, with job opportunities in Geelong, with... Um, making sure that your family's looked after. So it's a very, very dignified place for you and your family to attend to get the assistance that you need. And it's important to know that you're not going to be on your own, neither any of the other workers in Geelong. Elaine, Henry is saying that he's sure that he's not going to be on his own. He's going to be competing for jobs with 20-year-olds. Is that actually true? He may not be competing at all with... For, with, for jobs with 20 year olds at all and, and that's why he needs to make sure he takes the opportunities that the Workforce Development Centre is going to give him. There are opportunities already for, uh, for retraining through reskilling through the Gordon. The Gordon's doing a lot of work, that's our TAFE college, a lot of work with uh, our retrenched workers as are a number of other agencies in Geelong. It's, it's really important that you avail yourselves of those opportunities and, and make sure that you are uh, you take those opportunities so you're not on your own, Henry. Henry, can I just go back to Henry? You, you, you've dodged the bullet. I think you've uh, made that point. Um, you haven't actually been retrenched yet, but that's coming for you, isn't it? Yes, well, we feel like we haven't dodged the bullet. We just haven't been hit by it yet. Yeah. And it's coming. So the federal um, and state governments have set up a Geelong Region Innovation and Investment Fund, which is about employment creation across the region for Ford and Alcoa workers. I just want to know, how, how scary is that for you and your family, knowing that's coming, that your job is going to disappear? Oh, it's fairly scary. It's, I haven't had to face it for, for 30 years. And Henry, how has, how has Ford been uh, with you in yeah. helping you deal with this situation as well? That's what I'd like to know as the Mayor of this city. Well, they've set up some great infrastructure there at Fords and we've had Auto Skills Australia down there and um, it's all rolling along and I think it's been very good. OK, before we come to the other panels, we've got another uh, auto worker from Ford, Anthony 
uh, Anderson, I'll get Anthony <coughs> to uh, ask his question. I'll bring in the other panellists after that. Much like Henry, uh, as a worker at Ford, I know that I'm going to lose my job, just like hundreds of others in Geelong. All right? And whilst we do have carbon nexus and carbon revolution, that's not going to be the saviour. Right? They aren't going to save them. There's about, what, 150 jobs out there? Mm. But that's not the saviour. So the question to, for me is to Sarah, what is your government going to do? Where are the jobs? Where are the real jobs that are going to employ people? Because coming out of Alcoa, you're not going to be able to fit, say, 800 people into 150 jobs. You know? It just completely comes across that your government, that you're representing, has actually walked away from working people and their families because what is the future for myself, my family, as they grow up when there is no jobs? You know? I'm, not, I'm on the grift. I understand where the grift is. I understand the realities of it. But where is your government going to actually create a job, especially in this town? OK, the, uh, the GRIF is the Geelong Regional... Innovation. Yeah. The Geelong, Geelong Region. Regional Innovation, Innovation Fund. Innovation anyway, the question was fund. to you, Sarah. Um, the, the federal government hasn't put a huge amount of money into that fund so far. Uh, well, in fact, the federal government is the predominant funder, $15 million. We've also negotiated for Alcoa to put another $5 million. So it's now sitting at 29.5 million. But more importantly, we recognise that to grow jobs, we've got to grow the economy. And uh, that means taking cost pressures off all businesses. But Anthony, and also to you, Henry, um, Ford, I think, have done a fantastic job in this town. They've given you three years notice, and that has been fantastic. They've developed a lot of retraining programs, and that has worked really well. Now, some, of course, have left earlier, but we are very, very focused on the end of the car manufacturing industry and what we as a government have to do. Ian McFarlane, the industry minister, set up a, uh, a, 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 an economic review panel. I was a member of that panel. Geelong, I can assure you, had a very strong voice at the table, along with Frank Costa, who was also a member of the panel. Uh, Elaine came along and made a submission, as, me as well as many other stakeholders. And as a result, we have a $155 million growth fund um, specifically looking at the end of car manufacturing. But we're not just investing in car manufacturing, it's the next generation of manufacturing that we have to invest in. There is money there, 60 million from that fund, 30 million just for regional infrastructure out of that fund. The other point, uh, Henry, that you raised, what are we doing for older Australians? Um, not that I think that 50 plus is particularly old, but we are launching our restart program tomorrow, and that is a fantastic program. Governments have not addressed this before. $10,000 to an employer to employ someone who's been on income support who's 50 or over. Because we recognise that 50 is not old and there's a whole lifetime ahead of you to work. Um, and you need that support. Can I just, so say, can I just interrupt there, uh, just to pick up uh, the point that Anthony was making. Um, after all these years of the industry being propped up by governments, you made a pretty uh, fundamental decision that wouldn't happen anymore. The industry uh, can't stand on its own two feet, so it has to die. That's the, the, the tough decision, I suppose, oh, your government Tony, made. Tony, no, we don't accept that at all. Um, we actually think that there is a very... You, what, do you think the car industry think... is going to keep going, do you? Oh, well, aspects of the car industry are going to keep going, but manufacturing, I actually think, and our government thinks, that manufacturing has a very, very strong future, but it won't be traditional manufacturing. It's sadly not going to be Alcoa. It won't be making cars. But in advanced manufacturing, we think there is a very bright future for Geelong. I mean, look at the Land 400 program, their project, the $10 billion um, next generation Army Defence project. I've been working so hard, Elaine, uh, the likes of Darren, uh, walking up and down the corridors of Canberra, doing everything we can to drive those new opportunities into that region. The other thing that I just want to briefly mention... Well, no, I think we might actually cut you off there because um, you can come back yeah, to sure, some of these sure. issues. Okay. We want to hear from some of the other panellists. Richard Di Natale, go ahead. Uh, I suppose the first thing to say, Henry and Anthony, is um, I feel for you. It's tough. I, I really do. It's a tough thing that you're going through. It's a tough thing that your families are going through right now. And it's a tough thing that families right across the city are going through. And um, th I think the first responsibility of government is to make sure we look after you. And um, I'm worried about some of the things in the budget that mean that uh, it's going to be harder for people who are out of work, is, is the first thing to say. 
Um, I'm worried about uh, the short-sighted nature of governments that are pulling money out of education and training. We're, we're gutting TAFE at the moment. I don't know why on earth we'd be pulling money out of TAFE, because we really need to try and boost skills and training in, in people to um, find those jobs. In terms of where the jobs, where are they going to come from, I mean, it's not just a question for you, it's a question for you and your kids and families right across the city. Where are the jobs in manufacturing going to come from? And there are huge opportunities here in Geelong. Um, some of the auto parts manufacturers are now, have now moved into the renewable energy space. We've got one of the big auto part manufacturers mm -hmm. making components for solar panels. That's a great thing. Uh, we've got some other engineering companies now building wind turbines. So there are massive opportunities in the renewable energy space. And we could be a hub, a hub for renewable energy. We've got the infrastructure here. We just need to have a bit of vision. And instead of that, what we're seeing is we're seeing, unfortunately, Sarah's um, party deciding to uh, oppose things like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. That's the sort of investment bank that companies like the companies that you could work for in the future rely on to help move what are some uh, technologies that need to be commercialised. It provides the, the funding for that to happen. Richard, I think we might come back to that subject later. Yes, we'll go back to uh, Anthony. You just want to make a point, I think. Yes. A uh, couple of points. Back to where Sarah made the comment about the $29.5 million. Uh, that was the previous government, hence the reason why I was actually asking the point, what is your government going to do? <laughs> Not the previous government, your government. The other aspect of it as well is that after having a discussion with Ian McFarlane in November last year, you know, it didn't give me a warm, wonderful, fuzzy feeling because when I made the comment about we're going to be a dumping ground for cars coming in from all over the world, I got a sort of a shitty look at me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, right. I'm actually well, going to uh, just, just hold your point there because I actually want to hear from uh, Richard. Miles hasn't uh, had anything to say on this panel yet. I'll go to you and I'll come back to Sarah to answer the key point you just made. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, the, the points that both Anthony and Henry make really speak to the contemporary experiences of thousands of families in Geelong today. Uh, we are facing a, a very difficult moment in our economy and I think, Tony, you articulated exactly correctly. What we saw with the Abbott government was a conscious decision to let manufacturing and to let the car industry go in this country. Uh, but can I just say uh, at the outset... Um, I didn't actually say that. I said the car industry <laughs> in particular. I didn't well, say manufacturing because okay. there's been strong points here about different forms of manufacturing. Well, well forgive me so. then for verbaling you, Tony. Yes, uh, you. You certainly <laughs> said the, uh, the, the car... <laughs> no, well, you certainly said the car industry. <laughs> Um, and I do think that one of the issues about the car industry is it's the highest tech manufacturing that we do in Australia today. And one of the issues is that if you take the car industry out of the equation, it does make it difficult for the rest of manufacturing. But I did want to say one thing at the outset. First of all, can I say it is fantastic, I mean absolutely fantastic, that Q&A is here in Geelong. And the response that we've seen from the community mm. to this show yeah. coming here yeah. and shining a light on our community mm. has been absolutely wonderful. That in itself will not create jobs. We're here to talk yeah. about that. And, and, but, and, but, and no, the other thing that hasn't been said, Tony... Can I, can I just finish yeah. off, yeah, please? Can I just, can I just finish off? I, I also want to make this point uh, about Geelong. Th this is a wonderful city. It is a fantastic place. I I've had uh, the good fortune of being able to see more of the world than most. And no matter where I've gone, one of the things that is really clear to me is that of all the places I've been, far and away the best place to live is here, without exception, without exception. Um, I, I had an experience uh, a couple of weeks ago going to the footy in an absolutely first-class stadium. We want it to be a bit better, but it is a first-class stadium. Seeing the Cats play, the best sporting club in Australia, <laughs> uh, pro probably the world, but certainly <laughs> Australia. You bring your kids along, they meet friends uh, from school, I meet their parents who uh, are also friends of mine, we have a kick outside. Are you actually running That's for great. mayor? Can because we get back to jobs? No, <laughs> I just want to make the mayor sitting beside you. I just want to make this point. There is a sense of not just going to a sporting event but being part of a community. And that is something that we have in Geelong. Um, and we have the proximity to a great global city in Melbourne. Uh, but what we have here is a sense of community which will get us through. And if you look at the industries of the future, health, 
education and I really hope advanced manufacturing. Um, they are all industries which the global indexes say will be, will be growing industries worldwide. So there is a lot of optimism for the future of Geelong's economy, but we do need help in this difficult moment. And what we have found is that in the Abbott government, we have been left high and dry, and the fact that we have not seen a single cent dedicated to this city as a result of the decision that our COA made earlier this year is an absolute disgrace because we do need help okay. in that transition. Now that is your long speech for the evening. Well, yeah. The rest of the answers will be much shorter. Let's talk also about some positives about the city because man manufacturing is still the third largest employer in this city with 10,000 plus jobs. It's worth 10 billion to our economy. So to, for people to turn around and just say, well, you know, manufacturing, traditional manufacturing is walking out the door of this city. It's not going to happen on my watch. It's not happening. In fact, it is actually growing. And the good news is that residential growth is up 11%. There's $1.2 billion worth of major construction and redevelopment is underway in the city. $1.9 billion of construction and activity in building is up 8.3%. We are leading not only Victoria, but Australia as a regional hub in developing jobs. Now, I know it's not going to deal with the issues and the dinosaurs of the past. But I'll tell you what I'm doing as Mayor... Keeping I'll... hairdressing alive. Well, absolutely, <laughs> without question. <laughs> I... Sorry, mate. I, 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 I want to interrupt you because we've actually got quite a few questions to get to. Let's yeah. face up start? to some of these... No, I'm going to bring you in on, like the, on the back of this question. It's from Lee McBride. Oh, good evening. Um, the Abbott government has refused to support manufacturing and in Australia. And how is it better, how does the Liberal government think it's better for people who are blue collar workers to end up on welfare? Elizabeth in South Australia's experience is that two thirds of the people that lost their jobs in manufacturing, car manufacturing there, have not found work since losing those jobs. So you're standing here saying there's new jobs but maybe there isn't new jobs for these guys that are working in the, in the blue collar industries. Okay, Sarah Henderson. Uh, look, I, first of all, I want to just do away with the constant line that I do hear from Richard in Parliament all the time that the Abbott government doesn't support manufacturing. We are working day and night to support the jobs of the future. We are not throwing money like Julia Gillard did in 2012. When she came down, she gave $34 million to Ford, promised 300 new jobs. Seven months later, 330 jobs went. The same thing with the $40 million for Alcoa. The Labor Party promised long-term sustainable jobs. And now look where, where we are at. We recognise that to build jobs, we have to build the economy for all businesses. What did the Labor Party do for Borrell, workers at Borrell, all the, all the wonderful women who, who lost their job at Target? The point is we've got to drive down costs. And if you want to worry about manufacturing and look at what we are doing, we are getting rid of the carbon tax. It is a $1.1 billion hit on manufacturing. And Richard, uh, the biggest unemployment issues are in Richard's electorate in Cario compared for the whole region. And you really should hang your head in shame that you have not gone out and backed manufacturing workers on the carbon tax. Okay, I'm going to tell you what, it is a, uh, it is a very get, big issue. Before we get too far, let's go back and to our questioner, uh, Sarah, because she's got a hand up. Go ahead. The UK, Britain made a conscious decision to support car manufacturing in Britain because mm. they thought to lose manufacturing in that country would be too great a loss. The mm. Abbott government made a conscious decision to let it go down the gurgler, and now you're saying, why hasn't that money been spent on innovation in manufacturing rather than taking the money out altogether? Look, I'm very happy to respond to that. Okay, Ford, very, very briefly, yeah, do, you, Ford, do you accept... Ford it, it, actually... It, Sarah, can I say Very yeah. briefly, do, just can you just address the key point? What, sure. Did the government make a hard decision, as I suggested earlier, to let the car industry, which is unprofitable, die? Ford's demise happened under the previous government, under Labor government. We, we are making very substantial investments in, in manufacturing and in the jobs for the future. As I said to you, the growth fund is a $155 million fund. 
Now, I can just very briefly say today, uh, I, I, I'm very pleased to announce that the local employment coordinator, who's been working on a range of local programs, supporting local jobs, he's going to continue in his role, and that will be a, a half a million dollar investment in new programs, not just for Alcoa workers, but also the Alcoa supply chain. So I've actually been working very closely with the local employment coordinator the, who's, who uh, works to the Department of Industry, uh, looking at those small programs in the region to try and invest in skills and training. We have a $476 million industry skills fund that we have announced. We've got uh, enormous opportunities with the, the money that we have put into skills and to the jobs of the future. And I recognise, to those who have spoken tonight, it is really tough. Because there are businesses, this is a great region. I mean, this is, I think I represent the best and most beautiful electorate in the country. I go all the way down the Great Ocean Road, Colac. We recognise that at the moment for traditional manufacturing, this is really, really tough. There are businesses that want to move here and want to invest. There are the vehicles to invest, and we've made that possible. But the, the time is the issue. And okay. I have been very critical about well, Alcoa. What I suggest that we do. Yeah, so, well, first of all, no, first of all, he has to respond to the accusation just made against him <coughs> briefly, and then I'll move on to the other part. Uh, Tony, you were absolutely right when you said that there was a, a decision that was made by this government, uh, by the Abbott government, to let go of the car manufacturing industry. That is without question. And I make this point. Well, can I, in, can in, I, no, well, can, can I put this to you? Would, would the Labor government, unprofitable or not, have kept subsidising the car industry forever? Because that seems to be what you're suggesting. Oh, we made a commitment at the last election where there was a billion dollars difference in the proposition that we put to the Australian people about the car industry. We absolutely wanted to keep it in this country. There is not a car industry that exists anywhere in the world which is not a, in effect, public-private partnership between that country and the industry. And the reason why countries do that um, is precisely because of the point that you have, you maintain technological capacity within your country because it's the most high-tech manufacturing that we do. Now, we would have brought, and we did bring in government, a disposition to fight for jobs. You can't save everyone, that's true. And, and, and Ford did make its decision uh, last year. But what we did find was that two years ago, when our car looked like they were on the ropes, we did everything we could to save those jobs, worked with our car and kept it going. What we've seen under this government is that when faced with precisely the same situation, they cut Geelong loose. And that is the right. fact of the okay, matter. OK, I'm going to move on. We've got a lot of questions. We've got a lot of questions to go to. Our next question is from Bonnie Deverell. Where's Bonnie? Where's Bonnie? Go ahead, stand up, please. Thank you. Uh, this is directed at Darren Lyons. I'd like to know, knowing how many people have lost their jobs recently in Geelong, could you please explain your $2 million Christmas spree? <laughs> and wouldn't that be better used? Wouldn't it be better used helping people who are living in their cars and under bridges? So look, could you please explain? Look, yeah, I will. Number one, it's not uh, a $2 billion Christmas tree which has widely been publicised. I feel that it's $1.5 in the budget this year to actually light up Geelong. And that is in the wards, it is in the CBD, uh, it is projections all year round, not just one white night as you see in Melbourne and Sydney. I feel that we have to put a zing into this, uh, this city and we have, no, no, hear me out. we have to enlighten the city to get the focus uh, back on uh, Geelong as a major regional city. With regard to the Christmas tree, I think that we do need an icon on our wonderful north-facing bay. I do think it, it is going to be a big sign of a beacon of hope. And really, if we all think about it and we work out what it costs us as ratepayers, for each individual, at the end of the day, it costs $2.50, around about $5 per family to have something special. And before the Sydney New Year's Eve fireworks start, do you know what Sydney City Council did? They did every ratepayer in Sydney and they charged a dollar, a dollar that started off now what is one of the biggest light shows in the world. And I want to do that for Geelong. I want to do it for the people. And it's over the next five years and we haven't spent a cent on anything celebratory in this city for a long time. And I'll let you compare that 500,000 that has been allotted to this, and whether it gets through council or not, I'm not going to determine at this stage. 
But, but right opposite uh, the city of Melbourne, in the, in the, the Christmas Square, costs 400000 a year. I'll compare it to a couple of other things. GME events, the Festival of Sales, cost this city 180000 a year and 600000 uh, okay. in state government no, no, just, for three uh, days. You, you, we'll just it's a very about. small price to pay to uplift we'll our briefly, community. We'll just briefly go back to our question. <laughs> Sorry, okay, I just don't ahead. think we can afford to be spending that sort of money when there are people, families living in their cars and under bridges, that that $2, $2 million or no matter how much I stood on a, a homeless focus group last week and I've got to tell you Geelong is doing outstanding things compared to the rest of the state with homelessness. Some, Samaritan House is doing an amazing job. The Geelong City Council is doing an amazing job. So some people should actually get and have a look at our website and see exactly what we are doing for okay, the homeless right, in this city. Because we're much. doing a damn good job. I work with you. Okay. I think, we, I think we've dealt with that question. Uh, next question comes from uh, Bernadette Uselet. Uh, Jeff Kennett was the catalyst for the development of our spectacular north-facing waterfront in the early 1990s. Um, should we rely, should Geelong rely on big government intervention to uh, assist Great. and transform our economy, or should we be focusing on encouraging uh, free market forces and private investment to create jobs and stimulate our economy? That is a great uh, I'll question. I'll start with Elaine, however. That's a really great question. Thank you, Bernadette. Bernadette's the head of our Chamber of Commerce here in Geelong and um, does a great job. We need both. We need public investment in our region and we're starting to see that. But we also need private sector investment. And look how much private sector investment we've had in our region in the last 12 months. The redevelopment of the St John of God Hospital, the um, great new hospital that's going to be built, the Epworth Private Hospital. We've got the expansion of the Warren Pond Shopping Centre. We've got the arrival of Ascensi at its national headquarters here in, in Geelong. So we're seeing multi-million dollar investment here in Geelong from the private sector. We need help. We need help from the public sector, from state and federal governments. We're getting some, but we need more to address the challenges that our regions face okay, currently. Richard Dinatale. Yeah, of course you can do both. And in fact, Often government investment stimulates private investment yes. and they work together. Yep. Um, there's some, so many great stories in Geelong and so many great opportunities. We've got some of the best health facilities anywhere in the world and I think Elaine you just yes, mentioned some absolutely. of them. I, both my kids were born at the local hospital. We've got Barwon Health which, is, which leads the world. Yep. We've got the Animal Health Laboratory. It's one of only a handful of laboratories that do the work that it does. We could have a CDC here, Centre for Disease Control like the states have. We could be one of only a few countries anywhere in the world can, that can coordinate responses to infectious diseases. There's huge intellectual ca uh, capital here in this city. Huge intellectual capital. We've got the university. The university and what it has done with private investment and government investment around carbon fibre. Mm. So we've got carbon fibre which is, you know, some people talk about it as the aluminium of the 21st century. That project, and now we've got investors looking from all around the world, some of the major motor vehicle companies from all around the world, looking at what's going on there. And that's because we've had the university in partnership with the private sector, in partnership with government, all working together to ensure that we get that investment, that private sector investment that we need here. So let's, let's just go back, Richard, let's just go back to our question and I'll bring you in, uh, Sarah, after that. Um, you're the head of the Chamber of Commerce, I now know. So um, uh, <laughs> what are you... Uh, what are you <coughs> what do you think about the, the formula that Richard Di Natale just put in, which is you need public and private working together? We absolutely do need public and private working together. But the question is, how do we encourage particularly private sector investment? It's one thing going cap in hand to our state and federal governments, but it's another thing encouraging and stimulating private sector investment. Yep. What, are the, what are the things that we're going to do to attract that and to make it viable? OK, Sarah. The waterfront of Geelong is absolutely magnificent and I do have to add that my mother, the beautiful Anne Henderson who died more than 10 years ago, was the member for Geelong and she worked very closely with Jeff Kennett in the 90s to completely transform our waterfront. But it's a great example of government working together with the private sector. And I, I just refute the point that Richard made before again about the government not investing in, 
in anything post Alcoa. The regional infrastructure fund that we've announced, there's only one region that's really been affected by the end of car manufacturing and it's right here in Geelong. Now it's $30 million. The Mayor has come to see me about investing in a new pier, but I ask everyone here and in our region, come and see me. If you've got a project where you need government support, there is funding available. I can tell you I'm champing at the bit to get some of that money into Geelong. I'm chewing a chewing Ian McFarlane's ear every week in Parliament to make sure that we drive the investment, the jobs. I'm so positive about our region, about what we can do, but it does, it does involve both the private sector working together with government. I mentioned that there are many industries who are talking to the government at the moment about moving down here. The, the challenge is time. We've got, to, you know, we've got to create these jobs quickly, create the investment quickly. But the funding vehicles are there, and I'm really very okay. positive about that. All right, we'll go, um, before I bring you in uh, on the other side of the panel, I just want to go to our next question, which is from Davina Montgomery. It's related to these issues, and uh, there you are. Thank you. Hi. It is a similar question. I am really interested in hearing a bit more about job development and business growth development in Geelong. I think if we're going to get more jobs, we need to really focus on how we do that. Now, you've talked a bit about private sector investment. Elaine, you raised the investment, the $100 million investment by Accensi. That particular investment took over four years to get through the planning process to get here. Now, I don't know of too many businesses that can just sit there and wait for over four years to build on their investment plans. They've, they've got options all around the world. They don't have to come to Geelong. Yeah. So my question is, how do we fix that planning process so that we can have the vehicle that allow these businesses to come in or these organisations to invest? I, I think that's a question for me, not Elaine, as, as men. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Elaine, you, you know, on, as, uh, as a CEO of G21 and, and chair of G21 as mayor, look, this has been a passion of mine um, since... Uh, since wanting to become mayor of this great city. Uh, I've been a, a victim of the planning process and many uh, friends and colleagues over the region. Um, I think we have gone in great strides in the last seven to eight months. It was when I was first elected, it's the first meeting I sat down with the chief executive uh, and uh, the head of the planning and building department and said, this needs to change. And I I've got to tell you, um, in, the, in the last quarter, we've re really reached the figures that I've wanted to reach. There is absolutely no question this has been a huge stumbling block. But I will tell you, and this is figures are just out on Friday, when I first became mayor uh, of this city, um, over, from 400 new ABNs uh, in the middle quarter of last year to the first quarter of being mayor, we had 882. On Friday's figures, the second quarter, we've had 1,049. New ABNs registered. There's 11% growth. Uh, there was 19% growth on the last quarter, 35% on the first quarter. We have a focus on Geelong, and I've got to tell you, it is absolutely a passion of mine to make business happen faster and be open for business. Even the federal government used, while well, the, the, well, the Prime Minister was in New York just recently, okay, the Australia is uh, open for business. Darren, well, Geelong I, I don't want to interrupt is. your flow, but the questioner has a hand back up. We'll go yeah. back to you. Go ahead. Yeah, Darren, um, that's all fantastic, but I think we all want to know how is that planning process going to be speeded up? It, what is actually happening? Well, we, uh, number one, we've got a very new young team in there and uh, as a council and as officers and from the chief executive, we, it has been a major priority. We've got different people in there and setting much uh, uh, higher targets to gain. And we are achieving those targets. Okay. Things are, ge are right. getting better. And Darren. we're actually using real language to people that says, this is how we can do it. And you can get a phone call back and say, this is what you should be submitting. Not waiting for the phone to be hung up and then reapplying. That's the way we've got to change this city. We've got to get things done, and we're doing it. Darren, no one's doubting your passion. Um, let's hear from the other panellists, though. Richard Miles. Um, there is no doubt that there is uh, a role for uh, the public sector in terms of getting the economy going, but I think, going back to Bernadette's question, it's absolutely true to say that the ultimate measure is the size of our private sector economy. But we did see the uh, Brax Brumby government put in Geelong, for example, the headquarters of TAC. Mm. Fantastic decision, which has really helped revitalise the city. Yep. Uh, we saw, under the Gillard government, an announcement which uh, will see Geelong be the headquarters of the NDIS. Again, a wonderful decision which will help stimulate the economy. And by the way, tomorrow is the first 
uh, anniversary of the NDIS beginning in Geelong. So happy birthday to all the people who have been working there. Um, <laughs> We are, we're very proud to be the home uh, of the NDIS and, and, it, and we want to be uh, the most disability friendly city in Australia. But if I can just pick up on Davina's point, I do think that part of, uh, you're right, part of encouraging private sector development is making sure that that planning process is as smooth as possible. And too often what we have seen at a council level over many years uh, is a triumph of planning over economic development. Yeah. And right now, if you go out to Heels Road, and that's in the area where this company is setting up, what we have seen is the council being restrictive in the way in which it's selling off its land there, uh, which has made it harder for companies to come in. Uh, we've seen uh, the council put in place a whole lot of planning requirements around drainage, which have made it harder for companies to come in. So we do need to see all of that freed okay. up if we're right. going to get the private sector going. I'm just going to quickly go to Elaine to finish off this section of the program and uh, I'll bring you back to something that was sure. said earlier which is South Australia uh, where the car workers had lost their jobs, they're not doing so well in getting new jobs. Um, what do you see happening to address that? Well I think it's really, really important that we don't leave anybody behind in our region and, and I know through the state government departments they're working really hard to identify all of the retrenched workers, all the supply chain companies, and there are 110 companies that supply Alcoa. So it's a big job in six months to identify not just the workers who are going to lose their, their jobs, but all the supply chain. They're working very, very hard to identify those and look at new markets for the supply companies, but also look at how do we translate the skills that the Alcoa workers have and the Ford workers into qualifications, because many of them are internal qualifications, they're not things that they've got through a TAFE college. So how do we articulate their, what they already know into a, a certificate okay. level? And there, where do we take them? And the, the Workforce Development Centre that the uh, state government's setting up at the Gordon is going to be that one-stop shop for workers who will be helped on every measure with their families to find the appropriate job for them. It's very important as a region that we do not leave our people behind, and that is the biggest challenge okay. now. All right, we'll return to the issues that we're talking about through youth unemployment shortly, which is going to apparently reach 20% here if everyone's not careful. It's time to move along to something else, though. You're watching Q&A live from Geelong. Our next question comes from Michael Roach. Earlier this month, barely um, three kilometres from where we're sitting tonight, a young Tamil refugee named Leo committed suicide by setting himself on fire. He was terrified about being sent back to his homeland and the fate that awaited him when he got back to Sri Lanka. My 13-year-old and 10-year-old sons asked me, how could a, a young guy like that be driven to commit such a horrific and devastating act? And I really struggled to have any sort of remotely satisfactory answer. So I'm interested to know from the politicians on the panel, what do you think are the lessons that we as a nation, not as parents, but as a nation are teaching our kids about things like compassion, about being caring for victimised and marginalised people, and also about being a good global citizen, given that both the major parties have very similar asylum seeker policies? I'll, I'll start then outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We need to hear the answer now. I'm going to start outside the major parties. I'll go to Richard Di Natale first. Uh, well, we're teaching our young kids to harden their hearts and to turn their back on people in need. That's what we're teaching our young kids to do. I mean, that was a tragedy. You've got a young man here who was driven to take his own life. Um, and one of the great things about that story um, that fills me with some optimism is that after that happened, um, this man decided to donate his organs. And there are now people in Australia who are walking around with a new set of kidneys and lungs and people who can now see because he became an organ donor. And there are, if there's ever a clear example of the sort of contribution that these people want to make to this country, they're coming to us because they are in fear of their lives. They're coming to, to us because they need our help and we're turning our backs on them. And all they want to do is make a contribution, just like the many people in this room make to this great country. Um, when I think about 
the fact that we're locking up young kids, like my kids, in jails offshore. But when I think about young women who are pregnant in detention who can't get access to decent medical care, when I think about all of those things, um, look, it just fills me with great sadness. And I think we've got to take a step back. We've got to recognise that there is never, ever, a reason to lock up young kids, to deprive them of hope, and to drive people, because we've deprived them of all hope, to take their own lives. There's never a reason to do it. Um, it's a really difficult uh, policy area, but what we're doing is wrong. It's wrong. We're hurting people. We should recognise that being able to offer people protection, that's a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness. Um, and we've really... I'm not ready to wrap up. Yeah. I, I just urge both the major parties, we have to change what we're doing. We can't keep hurting people in the way that we're hurting them. We've got to recognise that we went into some of these countries, like Iraq and Afghanistan, because we thought those regimes were so brutal that we sacrificed Australian lives to get rid of them. And they're fleeing those conditions, the very conditions that we thought we should sacrifice Australian lives over. OK. All right. Sarah Henderson, um, bring, us, bring us back to this particular case. Uh, because as we heard from the questioner, uh, this man yeah. was in fear of being sent back to Sri Lanka. In fact, he'd actually come here from India. So if he was sent back to India, perhaps that would be slightly less of a problem. Uh, but he, the threat was to send him back to Sri Lanka, wasn't it? Uh, Tony, can I say in relation to Leo, that was a horrible and tragic death. Um, there is no about, doubt about that. And I've spoken to many people in our community who were really traumatised by what happened to Leo. Uh, but to link Leo's terrible suicide with our policies is, I think, a, a dangerous exercise. Uh, Leo, let me just explain. Leo, Leo was working in the community. He had a bridging visa. He could work. He had suffered... He had been suffering mental illness. Um, but the caseworker who saw him twice during that previous week, there was no indication of what was to happen. And, and let me say that this happens to 2,500 Australians every year. And suicide is a horrible, dreadful thing. And so often we can't see what is about to unfold. But Sarah, what about um, the kids who are harming themselves in detention? We've got young... We're driving young kids to harm themselves. I mean, uh, think about yeah. that. Just in, just in relation can, can to I Leo... Just, can I just yeah. interrupt just for a moment? Because we've actually got someone in the audience who knew uh, Leo. Cathy Bond has a question for us. Yes, thank you. I, I knew Leo. Um, I was a close friend of this gentle young man for over a year. Leo knew that Scott Morrison had promised that all Tamils would be returned. He was terrified because he'd been interrogated and tortured in Sri Lanka. His family had lived in a refugee camp in Tamil Nadu in India, but they were Sri Lankan nationals, um, ethnic Tamils, and Leo had been on occasion back to Sri Lanka to visit family, and he was in interrogated and tortured. So he knew what that meant. He knew what being returned to Sri Lanka meant for him. Um, I, I can't accept that uh, the current policy had nothing to do with Leo's death. I spoke to Leo the night before he, he tried to kill himself and, and, and succeeded. He died on the Sunday. I saw him on the Friday evening. He spoke of nothing else but his terror of being returned. What will happen to me if I'm returned? He'd waited 18 months for some sort of um, evidence from the government that his application was being processed. It wasn't. All he heard was Scott Morrison standing up and saying, no Tamils. OK, oh, all right. Well, let's, let's, let's get yes, can yes, I, yes. Can, I just, yeah. can I just yes, ask Kathy, a question now, because this uh, <coughs> relates. Now Scott Morrison has announced that he will propose an amendment to the Migration Act requiring asylum seekers to prove that they have more than a 50% chance of being tortured if they're returned. And, um, and if they can't prove that, they'll be returned to their home country. Who will be given the task of deciding, of making this arbitrary decision 
that will destroy or end lives to those returned to danger? Who will be that person and what guidelines will they use? Kathy, thank you. Look, I want to make a couple of brief points. The first one is that um, it's not true that Scott Morrison made any determination in relation to Leo. Um, his, his case was being assessed. So there was no such determination that's been made by Scott Morrison. Every asylum seeker who comes here has their case assessed on its merits. Now, um, in relation, our policy is in fact to give temporary protection visas to protect all people living in our community, to get them off bridging visas and to allow them to work. Now, that temporary protection visa gives people like Leo and the other Tamils and the other um, people on bridging visas in our community the opportunity to stay here and to get protection, but it's been blocked by the Greens in the Senate and by the Labor Party. So we can't implement that aspect of our policy, but we do recognise we do recognise the pressures on individuals. But let me say, and this is, I guess, I look back to what happened at the end of the Howard government. There were no children in detention. There were only four people remaining in detention. I don't want to see anyone in detention. And that's why we're implementing the policies we're implementing. OK, does that include... Just, no, just to quickly bring, bring you to the question that was asked um, at the end there, uh, this 50% chance of being tortured, is that, uh, is that actually how it's going to be assessed? And the question was... How will it be assessed? By whom? Uh, look, it's, it's a can, little bit of a... How can people know uh, whether there's 50% chance of being tortured? No, no, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit um, more complicated than that, Tony. There's no change under the test in the Refugee Convention, but the Labor Party actually used the same test. It's a more likely than not under both the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and also under the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment. The Labor Party was using the same test, but we've now needed to enshrine that in legislation. So, in, in effect, um, nothing has changed in terms of what was happening um, previously. However, the Refugee Convention, it still, um, it still is the case that if there is a real chance of someone facing persecution, they will, they will be given protection. Okay, all right. so I'd like to say from a local right. perspective, and I think it's very important true. your point, but I'd like to say from a, from a City of Geelong uh, Council perspective, has done a lot of work with an, a fantastic institution here called Diversitat, and I would encourage people to donate. And actually, I was on holiday when I got the phone call from the CEO, Michael Martinez, and there actually is a www.diversitat.org, and already it's raised $6,500 with regard to the fund for Leo. Uh, and that'll be uh, going to disadvantaged youth under a scholarship. So I would implore uh, everyone in this audience tonight and watching on TV, go on to Diversitat because it is a fantastic organisation and uh, it, it also this year won the inaugural settlement award throughout Australia. Right. So we are doing good things. Let's, let's go. Uh, I'll, I'll let's things in July. hear from the shadow uh, immigration minister, <clears throat> whose policies are very similar. I might add. Well, I, I would contest that. Um, I think when you, uh, at the end of the Labor government, we had 20,000 places that we were offering in our humanitarian program. That's been slashed by this government down to 13,750. That's more than 6,000 people each and every year who will be denied an opportunity to make their lives full of hope in our country. So I do think to say that the policies are the same uh, is just is, is not right. But can I just talk about um, the situation with Leo Seaman Pillai, which was an absolutely tragic circumstance. And I do think that compassion needs to be the basis upon which we make decisions in this really complex area. And it certainly is from the point of view uh, of Labor. And I, I do agree with one thing that Sarah has said, and that is I, I think it is a difficult game to start talking about the particular links in individual cases because we don't know um, the, the, the history of, of Leo in, in its detail. But I would make this observation. If all people here, if all this cohort here, who are already more uh, mentally vulnerable than the community at large, if all they hear is hardline rhetoric and a total absence of hope in the way in which this debate is conducted in this country, 
then it ought not be surprised uh, to any of us that we see really tragic circumstances occurring. And I do think... Including in the offshore detention centres which you set up? Well, I do think... Uh, <coughs> Tony? I think, what, I think that means that we do need uh, to have in place a debate which does provide hope. And what we saw from this government, and I'll come to the point that you just made, Tony. Well, you have to we do it very briefly because we've got other things to well, get to. Well, what we saw from this government in terms of its hard-heartedness was uh, a refusal even to grant a visa to Leo Seaman Pillai's family to come to see their own son, their own brother's funeral. <laughs> That's, that. that says everything about... Um, the state of mind of the government as it is at the moment. But I would make this well, point. There is, there, true, this yeah. is a deeply complicated issue. Um, there are mm. 7 million people in the world today seeking permanent asylum amongst the population of 43 million who are displaced. Now, I said before we had a, a program of 20,000 places that we offered, but you could offer 100,000 places, and not even the Greens are suggesting that. And it still amounts to this fact that for both the Greens, Labor and Liberal, we're principally saying no to millions upon millions of worthy. Okay. But and that is the wicked... No, no, that is the... young kids. Well, you can talk about I mean, locking... locking you up can, young kids you can talk in about, detention. You can talk about locking up kids I mean, in detention. I mean, what excuse and, is it? Sure. We're denying pregnant women well, access to medical care. Well, well, the answer to that, Richard, is no one wants to see children locked up. So why up. are we locking them up? If you let me finish. No one... <laughs> No one wants to see children locked up in detention, and in government we did everything we could uh, to get children out of detention. But you make you say that there is never an excuse for a child to be in no, detention. No, there's never well, an excuse. Okay, never. well maybe one of them is that their parents are there, and so maybe one of them is that you shouldn't be separating mm. children from their parents. And that's and why the reality their parents is, shouldn't if, be there. And, and, and that's why their if, parents if you let me finish, most of the children who are in detention today are there because their parents are there. There are unaccompanied but, but minors there, in detention there right are, now. And right there are now. a few, and there are a few in Nauru. And, and what it would mean um, to have a circumstance where those okay. people came to Australia is to invite people smugglers, as they did, to put boatloads and well, boatloads full of people... You don't believe that, Richard. Do you really believe that, Richard? It was a matter really of really fact. believe that? You okay, can't I'm get sorry, past right, the fact, okay, Richard, right, that right, right, some people just died on our hold on, and hold we need on, to do something on, about on. that. I'm, I'm just going to draw a line under this because I think it's a discussion we've had many times. We want to hear, actually, uh, I did promise we'd go to a question on youth unemployment. We've got one. It's from Nicholas Sluggett. Hi. Um... I'm a university student living in Geelong and uh, I'll be finish my degree in two years. Uh, now, my parents are not financially capable of supporting me, so I'm expected to live away from home and I'm just wondering how I'm meant to be doing this without any sort of government subsidy or income support for the first six months. I'm wondering about how I'm meant to be able to afford an internet bill, a phone bill, petrol prices or even pay for public transport for the ability just to search for one job, let alone 40 a month. And I feel like that you're effectively punishing me and putting me further in debt for trying to further my education and contribute to this city. And I just want to know how this is meant to be sustainable for Geelong. OK, before I go to the politicians, I want to hear from Elaine on this. Thank you very much for that question, Nicholas. I've got two people like you at home that uh, have got university degrees and have never been able to find work in the, in the professions that they've been trained for, and it is extremely hard. And now we're faced with the, with the um, accumulating debt, their help debt, um, which they're accumulating, and may, will take decades to pay off uh, under the proposal. And I think that we need to... The federal government needs to have a really hard look at this proposal regarding the help debt and also the New START proposal. I think that our community wants a much fairer society than one which abandons people for uh, six months of a year and expects them to fall back on their family uh, when many families don't have that capability. And I think it's a very important question that you raise in our community because I know for a fact there aren't 40 jobs for um, young people to apply for every week in this community, and so I, I'm worried as a mother <laughs> about that. OK, Sarah Henderson, uh, given what we were talking about before, all these opportunities, is that a bit of a reality check, in fact? Uh, well, look, we recognise, and good luck with the rest of your studies, and there will be some good lead time for you to, to look at what opportunities are out there for you. And we've got a range of 
um, support for young job seekers, um, our jobs relocation um, assistance, a jobs bonus. So there is a, a whole range of things that we are doing for young people. But we do think that the best form of, of welfare is work and we do have a strong focus on getting young people into work. Now, in relation to the six months, yes, for young people coming out of school, uh, you will have to wait six months, but there are a whole range of exemptions. If you're a parent, if, you're on a dis if you've got a disability... Um, no, no, I'm just giving you the exemptions. Well, Sarah, can, that, I, just go, can I just go back to our lots questioner? Of, lots because of things happen at university. Our questioner is uh, <laughs> but there are, shuffling for feedback. I don't think he's intending to have children <laughs> no, no. Uh, but for that there, purpose. But if you've got partial work capacity, but if you're yeah. young and fit, uh, there is a six-month wait, and then that will give you the opportunity to look and then there will be a work for the doll requirement. Now, that starts tomorrow okay, in July. OK, all right. Let's, let's, just, go back. let's a, just go back to our question, that's, because that's being portrayed as an opportunity for you. <laughs> <laughs> you see it like that. Well, um, my other concern is the fact that Henry and Anthony pointed out that other older workers with more experience are being let go, and they're going to be competing for the exact same jobs I'm going for part-time whilst trying to support myself studying at university. And my benefit's cut off when I finish my degree, and then I have a six-month black hole there mm -hmm. before mm. I start getting any sort of benefit again. And I'm not a parent, so I won't... <laughs> and hopefully it won't be. <laughs> no, will you... But, uh, uh, what does he study? I'm well, going to... Sorry, I've got one last question. We're nearly out of time. I'm going to go to our final question for the evening. You can all answer it and you can reflect on uh, what you've just heard as well. Our last question is from Mark Horstead. This is predominantly a question to Sarah Henderson. As a former federal Liberal candidate, I'm personally deeply ashamed of the federal government's attack on those receiving welfare payments. I would remind you... I would remind you, Ms Henderson, and your colleagues in Canberra, that it's a cornerstone of the philosophy of liberalism that the strong have a duty to protect the weak and vulnerable. The aged, the sick and the unemployed are not economic burdens for this society. These are people who are our fellow Australians who need our respect and our protection. And the question I would put to you, when did your party receive the mandate to attack these people in this way? Okay, thank you very much, Sarah Henderson. Um, look, I don't, I don't accept it's an attack, and let me just make one very strong point. Um, very proudly, and it was a policy, and of course implemented by the previous government as well. We funded the National Disability Insurance Scheme. This is a life-changing social reform. The Labor Party ran a scare campaign saying we weren't going to fund it, but let's not forget. Good economic policy means good social policy. We've got a huge job to rein in the spending and the debt and the deficit of labour. So we have to make some responsible decisions. But we are, what's important, we, we, are, we recognise that those who most need our help will get it. That is absolutely fundamental. And look at our commitment to disability. I mean, it is, as I say, it is life-changing. $22 billion a con contribution of the federal government and the states by the time it's fully rolled out. But in relation to welfare, we recognise that those who most need our help will receive it. And there's been a report today talking about streamlining and making welfare more efficient. And yes, there will be some that will actually have yeah. to look at what their work opportunities are. It's not disability, for instance, the disability services pension is not a set and forget payment. So we do, as a government, have a responsibility not to leave young men and women on welfare because that is toxic also. Uh, the best sort of life is one where you can work and make a meaningful contribution Sarah, to society. I'm just going to, uh, and that's we, what we, our focus is. We are uh, virtually out of time. I'll quickly go back to our question. Uh, what specific things are you talking about? You were, that's very general in your case there. Just give us a quick summary. Very quick summary, Tony. The attacks on the aged the attacks on those people who are receiving disability pensions, the attacks on the people who are unemployed. We've heard people tonight who are unemployed and will become unemployed through no fault of their own. These are not policies that would have happened under Menzies or Fraser 
or even oh, how? Times have changed. Why are they happening under us? OK, I mean, all right. And before, before you go, Darren, Richard Miles, brief answers from everybody, please. Yeah, I mean, times have changed oh, since, uh, since Benzies, by the way. Uh, we are in the 21st century. But, but what I will say, what I will say, I agree with you on the agency, but I don't agree with you on everything that is unemployed, because unemployment, particularly in certain regions of Geelong, has become to toxic. We are in a third-generation unemployment. Mm. We don't want to be there, ladies and gentlemen. We want to fix it, and we've got to create jobs. But it's going to take all of us in the community okay. to help and live, love Geelong okay, and all right. help each okay. other. Thank you, Darren. Richard Miles. Well, it has to be a short answer, I'm afraid. Well, what we've, uh, what we've seen... Uh, Sarah talks about support for people on disability. We've seen today this <coughs> government seek to demonise people on a disability by looking at cutting the disability support pension. That's the reality of what the Abbott government is doing here. And no, I think what you see... That's not true. That is true. And I think what you see in true. both of true. the questions that have been asked is highlighting the fact that what this budget does is cut a massive hole in the social safety net at a time when Geelong needs it most. And that's why I really think that this budget has cut Geelong loose. And if you want to measure the budget emergency, which is seen as being the basis for doing it, measure it by the fact that in this same budget, they've put in place the Prime Minister's own pet project, the Pay Parental Leave Scheme, which is going to pay $50,000 checks to millionaires. I want to talk about welfare. That's what's going okay, on. OK, all right. And, and, that, and that is the measure I'm going to have to cut you off here. I'm going to give the last exist. word. I'm sorry we're out of time to our other panellists. Uh, Sarah Henderson, you get the last word because that attack was mainly launched at you. Tony, or your party. We, I thought yes, you just thank, defended it. Tony, thank you very much. Tony, we have a responsibility to grow the economy, to drive down the cost of doing business so that every small business, every large business in our community can deliver the jobs we need. And that's what our government is doing. We've got to rein in the reckless spending of labour, which has really destroyed so much of the economy. Absolutely. And Tony, I love this region and we, we, we are determined to grow jobs, we are determined to grow the economy and we are, not, we are going you, to do it positively and embrace you, this wonderful region that we live in. You don't do it by condemning people to poverty. It's you still three quarters of a trillion dollar debt. It's got to okay. be bad. Right. All right, all right. And we could keep going, going, we, we could keep going for a long time. Poverty. We could we keep going for a long time. I'm, to I'm told we're over time. That is all we have time for. I'm sorry about that. Uh, please thank our panel, Elaine Carbines, Richard Di Natale, Sarah Henderson, Richard Miles, Darren Lyons. Thank you. Thank you. And to this great Geelong audience here at the uh, Performing Arts Centre, please give yourselves a quick round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And, well, next Monday on Q&A, a very different angle on our national issues. The economy is the driving force for political decisions, but our politicians are really trained economists. Next week, we'll be joined by four professors of economics with the Nobel Prize-winning American Joseph Stiglitz, the distinguished government advisor, uh, Ross Garno, businesswoman, academic and columnist, Judith Sloan, and the director of the Centre for Contemporary Chinese Studies, Christine Wong. Um, as I've heard uh, one famous political advisor once claimed, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, what can we learn from these learned economists? What can they tell us about our future. Until next week's Q&A, good night. <laughs>